Hello and welcome to this month's Standard Motor Products Power Hour session. Uh, the title today is Keeping It Cool. And as the title suggests, uh, we're going to focus on air conditioning today. Now, uh, we are also sticking with uh, air conditioning as a topic again next month. So if you like what we share with you today, don't forget to join us again next month, uh, April 10th, when we will be discussing electronically controlled variable displacement compressors. So with that, uh, we're going to get underway by reviewing our mission statement, and uh, which goes as follows. Our mission statement is to educate aftermarket automotive technicians on established and emerging technologies uh, via instructor-led and online training programs that enable them to perform accurate, efficient diagnosis and proper vehicle repair. Don't forget also that we are an ASC accredited training provider. <clears throat> So here's what we're going to be discussing in today's session. Uh, how original compressors fail, that is the factory compressor, how it first fails on the vehicle. Uh, we're going to have a discussion about uh, what components must are replaced versus what components I might consider replacing versus flushing. Uh, we are going to look at compressor lubrication, particularly adding oil, where do I add it and so on. It's the most common cause or the most common question we get here at the training center. Uh, we will share some service tips as we go along the way, and we're going to wrap up the conversation here with some uh, refrigerant news updates, uh, particularly as it relates to R134A retrofitting. So uh, let us ask the question and hopefully answer uh, the question of how original compressors fail. Uh, understand back in the day when we were using R12 and mineral oil, uh, this, uh, this comparison here makes it very easy to understand uh, the challenge of uh, lubrication in R134A systems. Back when it was R12 and mineral oil, uh, mineral oil and R12, they, uh, they, there's a strong molecular bond between the molecule of uh, mineral oil and uh, R12 refrigerant, and so uh, they mix together homogeneously as a liquid, and even when the liquid level in the evaporator gets low and the refrigerant is evaporating, uh, that gaseous refrigerant will carry a molecule of mineral oil with it. There will be a molecule of mineral oil attached to the molecule of refrigerant and so even when the liquid level in the evaporator is low, it's relatively easy to maintain compressor lubrication in an R12 system. However, things are significantly different in an R134A system. There's a relatively weak molecular bond between the PAG oil and the R134A. Uh, now they mix together homogeneously, if you like, as a liquid. Uh, when they're both liquid. Um, however, when the refrigerant starts to evaporate, uh, because of the weak molecular bond between the PAG oil and the R134A, the, the refrigerant tends to leave uh, the, um, the oil behind. So in the evaporator, you know, uh, as the vehicle ages and the liquid level in the evaporator gets low, um, especially if the customer hasn't stayed up on service, uh, now the liquid level is way down low in the evaporator. And so what tends to happen is the oil, as the refrigerant evaporates, it leaves the oil behind and the oil starts dropping out in the bottom of the evaporator. Now, the thing to keep in mind here is that refrigerant by itself, pure refrigerant by itself, is a powerful degreaser. And so if all that you have coming out the top of the evaporator back to the compressor is pure gaseous refrigerant, over time, you know, as the vehicle ages and the liquid level gets lower and lower and more oil drops out, that refrigerant strips the lubricating film of oil from all the internal moving parts in the compressor, from the pistons and the cylinder walls. So now you get metal on metal, uh, wear begins, and as it ages, as the compressor ages, you get fine microscopic abrasive particulates sloughing off the pistons and cylinder walls. Now, the thing to understand that this debris is microscopic, think of volcanic ash, if you like, getting carried on the wind, um, that microscopic abrasive debris will be transported throughout the system. In other words, right from the compressor output, right around through the system, uh, you're, and even back into the suction line, going back to the compressor, you're going to get some microscopic abrasive debris uh, as the liquid level gets lower and the oil starts dropping out of the evaporator and we run out of lubrication. And so, in fact, of course, on the day that the compressor fails, there will be lumps and chunks and piston rings and so on in the discharge line coming, you know, immediately coming out of the compressor. But long before that, there will be fine microscopic abrasive debris 
transported throughout the system. But that abrasive debris tends to be concentrated in the oil that has dropped out in the bottom of the evaporator. And in fact, uh, uh, the picture on the right here is a compressor we tore down. And on the fingertip here, you can see that it's got that sheen to it. Again, fine microscopic, microscopic abrasive particulates. That's what's been transported throughout, the, transported throughout the system. So if you look in the waste oil bottle here, and you can maybe do this on your own machine back in the shop, um, you know, if, you're, if, the, if your oil bottle has been drained or rinsed in a while, if you just take it off the machine and look in the very bottom of it, and you'll often see there will be a deposit, like a silky deposit of this fine microscopic abrasive debris, which of course has been recovered from various vehicles through your machine, and that gives you a sense of the contamination that I'm talking about um, in a typical system when the compressor fails. Now, regardless, you know, some systems leak more than others, of course, but regardless of the system, whether it's a Hyundai or a Humvee, ultimately over time, gradually over time, if nobody has serviced the system, uh, the, you know, they're all going to leak. The refrigerant leaks gradually over time, and we get oil dropping out in the compressor, and uh, sorry, in the evaporator, and of course, inevitably, eventually, the compressor fails, especially if the customer has not stayed up on their maintenance. So uh, let's get into, you know, we've got a vehicle in the shop, the compressor has failed. Let's take a look, consider some of the key things, you know, what do we believe is required for a successful repair that, so that the vehicle will leave blowing ice cold air and will stay, will stay fixed, will not come back, you know, we will not have a comeback. So, um, you know, this slide kind of summarizes uh, what we, you know, what I think is required and necessary for a successful comeback-free compressor replacement. So here we are, um, if, we look, if we look here for just a minute and look at our, you know, look at our cart, uh, you will see here's a, here's a typical compressor. And if I look here, you can see if I just run my finger inside of here or here, this is what I'm talking about. This is the fine microscopic abrasive particulate uh, that I'm talking about this. It's, it's very microscopic. It will fit through virtually every filter in this system, especially the finer parts of it. And this is what gets, you know, this is the, the debris that gets distributed throughout the system. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is why we emphasize the understanding that every inch of the refrigerant path needs to be either new or flushed. So, um, and in this particular case here, you can see uh, that there's quite a bit of rust inside the system, so I get the sense from uh, this particular failure here that the shop probably did not do a great job with evacuation and getting all the moisture out of the system. So let me put this on the side for just a moment, and we're going to take a look at some of the, let's start that conversation. Let's discuss, well, what do I need to, you know, what must I replace versus uh, what could be flushed? Well, I think you understand that you can't flush the accumulator, or for that matter, you can't reflush the receiver dryer. So the accumulator here, it's got the desiccant bag inside. That's full of the desiccant medium, as you can see here in the jar. Uh, the accumulator acts like a kind of a snorkel. You can see the, this tube here goes to the very top of the can. So if liquid gets in here, there is literally, if you put liquid solvent in here, it's going to attack the desiccant medium, turning it into a mush, and you can't get the liquid out anyway. So flushing an accumulator is just not an option. And for the pretty much the same reasons, here we've cut apart a, an old uh, receiver dryer. It's got a huge filter inside. And for much the same reasons, you know, it's also got the desiccant and medium in here. You can't flush. It's just not possible to flush a, um, a receiver dryer either. So obviously those parts must be... Um, you know, must be replaced. Now, the orifice tube, of course, we also, I mean, it's a very inexpensive part anyway, but in most orifice, in most orifice tube type systems, the orifice, this filter, this screen that you can see here, see here is the only filter in the system, and so, um, you know, it, it doesn't take a lot of debris to clog this up. So we require, just as I think most manufacturers insist, that as part, if you, if part of compressor warranty, that you must replace the, um, the orifice tube. Um, now, the thermal expansion valve uh, is slightly different. Uh, I highly recommend um, that you replace the thermal expansion valve. Uh, don't forget, over the past several years now, we've introduced uh, service kits that typically include all the parts you would need uh, to, for a, a quality compressor replacement. Um, 
you know, the, the, thing about a, the thing about a thermal expansion valve is it can't be flushed. So if you see any evidence of contamination at the inlet to a thermal expansion valve, this is just uh, a few thousands of an inch in, uh, of uh, clearance here. So if there's any evidence of uh, contamination at the inlet to the uh, thermal expansion valve, you should replace it. Um, it because it can't be flushed. It's simply, you know, you're just not going to move any uh, volume of refrigerant through uh, the thermal expansion valve. So we highly recommend that you replace the thermal expansion valve. <clears throat> now, while I'm on the subject of thermal expansion valves, uh, here is typically, this is going to be, you know, this is going to be the firewall here. As you've probably seen, on many vehicles, there is a, there is a plate inside the firewall that, uh, that the that the two screws, that the TXV screws, attach to, um, to this plate, a retaining plate that sits inside the HVAC case. Now, a problem you can run into is when you take out the, the screws, the TXV retaining screws, this plate, this retaining plate, can fall down inside the HVAC case. A solution for that is to go to the hardware store, get yourself a couple, two, I've got another one here, two 11.5 millimeter uh, screws, uh, put them in a drill and just grind the top off them, the heads off them here. And now basically you've got two dowels, two, if you like, insulation dowels. So when I take out the first retaining screw, I put one of these uh, handles in here, if you like, or dowels, and I screw it into the uh, plate inside the evaporator. And now this acts as a, it, this prevents the plate falling down inside the evaporator case. And it can also be helpful when you're installing the new TXV valve. It can act as a guide when you're trying to cinch up uh, the new TXV to the evaporator. And by using a second one, you can make life even easier still if you have two of these screws. So that's just a quick tip here on, um, you know, on replacing uh, thermal expansion valves. So the next thing, of course, is the uh, condenser. Well, do I flush or replace? The thing to understand about a modern condenser is it is simply impossible to flush. If we look here, I've got a couple of uh, cutaways. Here's the tube here. If I look here, this is what you would see looking in through the front grill. If I look at a cross section of this tube here, it's probably hard to see at this, at this distance. But there's about maybe 10, 11 little micro tubes here, tiny, tiny tubes barely more than the diameter of a hair. So if a, uh, if a condenser, if, if the uh, compressor has failed catastrophically, forget about flushing one of these condensers. It's simply impossible. The other limiting factor is most of these condensers are what we call multi-pass, so the header tanks on either side of the condenser are dammed, and so the refrigerant passes back and forth about four times before it exits as a liquid on the bottom. And so if you have any kind of debris at all in the air conditioning system, it is simply impossible to flush a modern condenser. Now the other complicating factor is, uh, of course, most modern condensers now have a, um, you know, the, the dryer is usually integral to the header tank on the end of the condenser. Um, now, because you can't flush a condenser, typically a new condenser is going to come with uh, a new dryer, you know, new, new dryer cartridge inside. Uh, some of them you can't even replace the dryer cartridge, it's completely encapsulated. The point I want to emphasize here is uh, the only time that I'm going to be replacing uh, a dryer cartridge by itself is if I'm doing maybe some, uh, you know, two or three year preventative maintenance, air conditioning maintenance service on the vehicle, where if the dryer is easy to extract, in other words, it can be extracted from the top without removing the whole front end of the vehicle, then I might consider replacing the dryer as, um, you know, as, as a service item. But if the compressor has failed uh, and it's got a TXV system with the, an integral dryer as part of the header tank of the condenser, forget about, you've got to replace the condenser because you can't flush condensers with flat tube multipass condensers, and especially if it has an integral dryer in the header tank of the, um, of the compressor, sorry, uh, of the condenser. So, um, as I say, you can't flush condensers, and that opens, so now let's get into the area where we want to talk about, um, you know, what, you know, let's talk about hoses. Should I, you know, this conversation comes up a lot. Uh, should I consider flushing or replacing hoses? Well, as I hopefully communicated at the beginning here, um, hoses are a, you know, hoses, 
you know, a, a slow leak that results in a, a low charge oil dropout in the evaporator is a common cause of catastrophic, it's often the root cause of a catastrophic compressor failure. So if I look at a typical hose assembly here, um, you can see I have a choice of either uh, replacing or flushing this hose. Well, if I take a, a, a can of Dura 2, this would be my typical, this is, a, this is a quality flush solvent, highly evaporative, uh, doesn't leave any residue, so this is the kind of solvent that I would be recommending that you use during a flushing uh, process. Problem is, is it, it is expensive. It does a fantastic job, but it is expensive, and you're going to need two to four, in my opinion, for your typical vehicle with one evaporator, you're going to need two to four uh, quarts of uh, a good quality flushing solvent, and that could be anywhere from one to two hundred dollars, depending on, uh, you know, depending on where you're shopping. So, um, therefore, uh, for me to flush, if I was to consider replacing this hose. I would have to flush it. And to flush it, I need a flush, I need the Dura 2, like we discussed, a good flush solvent. I'm also going to need a flush tool. So here is the flushing tool. Uh, I mean, there are some components that I will have to flush, and this is the type of flush tool that I would recommend. It's got a pressure gauge here so I can control the pressure. It's got a, you know, it's got a control knob that I can actually dial the pressure up to the desired level. Uh, I can connect up shop air so I can connect a permanent shop air supply. It's also got a, a shutoff valve which, can ena which enables very precise control of the flushing process. It's especially helpful to avoid wasting exp uh, expensive uh, flush solvent. The concern I have though is for me to, um, for me to flush this hose assembly. I got to figure out how to attach this. This, by the way, this another advantage of this flush tool is it's got a universal adapter that will enable me to attach the tool to the hose or the evaporator or the hose that I'm trying to flush, which is fine. Uh, the problem is when you consider the cost of the flush, when you consider the labor that's going to be required to put the flush solvent in the tool, connect the tool up to the very, you know, the suction line, the liquid line, the discharge line, all the different lines that I might consider flushing, oftentimes, and I mean this quite literally, it is often literally cheaper to replace the hose assembly than to flush it. And the other downside of flushing old hoses is this hose here, for example, it's probably, you know, 9, 10, 15 years old, we don't know for sure, for sure, but um, you remember, uh, you know, rubber is organic. It shrinks, you know, hardens, crystallizes as the vehicle ages. It's been heat cycled 10,000 times. And so if the compressor, as we have, uh, we may have an example here, if the compressor comes in with a hole in the crankcase, like my uh, scroll example over here, if my compressor comes in with a hole in it like this here, this is pretty extreme, but I'm sure you've seen compressors or vehicles come in your shop with a crack at least. In the in the compressor uh, in the compressor case, or maybe the front seat is leaking, or something of that nature. Meaning, it's not always possible to pressure test or properly leak test the system until you've replaced everything, pulled a vacuum on the system, recharge the system, and you're doing your final leak check, and now you find that that hose is leaking. So, as I said, it is literally often cheaper uh, to replace the hose assembly than to be trying to uh, flush it. So just keep that in mind as you go about your business. Another issue when it comes to flushing hoses is this here. You may have noticed this. This is what we call an internal heat exchanger. You've seen it probably on later model uh, R1234IF vehicles. Its idea is the idea behind it is to make up the, the efficiency difference between 134A and R1234IF. You can see, um, you know, it's got the liquid line and the suction line are fused here, and they're also fused here. Not get too deep in the details how it works here. You know, it uses the cold refrigerant returning down the center uh, from the evaporator to extract a few more uh, degrees of heat energy out of the liquid refrigerant as it uh, uh, goes up toward the thermal expansion valve. And if you look here, this is really a double wall pipe. And there is a passage, and you know, we may be able to see it here, there is a thin passage uh, between the, the outer wall of the inner pipe and the inner wall of the outer pipe. And so by routing the cold refrigerant down the center, the hot liquid in, the, in this 
between the two the, between the two pipes. We use the old cold refrigerant to take some additional heat energy out of the liquid refrigerant before it gets to the thermal expansion valve. The downside of that is, as you can see here, these passages, if the compressor has failed, that microscopic debris de uh, circulating in the system, it is very possible for the, th for the internal heat exchanger to become, uh, to become clogged. So um, keep in mind also that um, if the, I'll just put this uh, hose away here one second. If the hose assembly, uh, like the one we're looking at here, has any kind of a f uh, muffler or filter in line with the hose, uh, those hoses need to be replaced. You can't, if we look inside this muffler here, you will see that this tube comes in, it goes hard up against the end of the can, and if we look deep inside of it, you will see, if you were to cut one of these apart back at your shop, you will see there's just a couple of pinholes, about four pinholes around in a circle in this tube. That's the only way for the refrigerant to get through this muffler. And so if debris from a failed compressor gets inside this can, you're never going to get it out of there. So bottom line is, um, you know, if, if the hose assembly has any kind of a muffler or filter in the line, you should replace those types of hoses. <clears throat> so, um, uh, Again, if some of these hoses, by the way, the one on the lower right there, has a paper filter inside, and you know you're looking at it. It looks like just uh, you know maybe a muffler in the line, an expansion chamber. In fact, this one's got a paper filter inside. That's the kind of thing that's going to ruin your your diagnostic day, ruin a good air condition repair. Any evidence of bubbles or mufflers in the line, you need to replace those lines. So that kind of brings us into the conversation about well, you know what. Can I flush or consider it flushing versus what must I replace? And of course, the, the, we're replacing the compressor, that's what they cause in the shop today. We're replacing the condenser, if it's multi flat tube, multi pass, multi path, it can't be flushed. Um, the orifice tube uh, or the thermal expansion valve, pretty much I'm considering those a, a must replace type of item. And of course, the accumulator for the reasons we described. So typically, the components, on le the evaporator, of course, can be flushed unless it is, um, unless it's leaking. And so the components that I'm typically either going to flush or replace are the discharge line, the suction line, and the liquid line. Now normally, oftentimes, the liquid line is a solid aluminum line between the condenser and the expansion device. And, and usually, you can get away, if it's a solid piece of aluminum, you can get away with flushing a liquid line. Unless, of course, it's a captured orifice tube, where the orifice tube is cinched into the liquid line, in which case, you will, in order to replace the orifice tube, you will have to replace the whole liquid line. So if I look at the suction line and the discharge line, for the reasons that I just described, uh, or explained, I'm going to consider replacing those hoses rather than flushing them. It is literally often cheaper. And so here, for example, I estimate, you know, to do a good, thorough, hygienic uh, flush job, you're going to need between, you know, you need one full quart to flush the evaporator, and then, depending on how much additional lines you have, or if you have a dual EVAP system, you're going to need, you know, two to four uh, quarts on average, I think, to, to do a good flushing job. And that is, you know, somewhere between one and 200 bucks is my estimate. The other problem with flushing hoses, if you look in the top right there, often that microscopic abrasive debris becomes embedded in the, in the barrier, in the dense uh, elastic barrier material, inner, the inner liner of the hose, and can be very difficult to uh, dislodge with just a simple flush, and it ends up you know, working its way out later when the system is under, under higher pressure. So, as I said, rubber, it's organic, came out of the size of the tree, hardens, shrinks, crystallizes, the microleak that results in the low charge is often at a hose crimp. So, if we must flush, you know, I mean, the evaporator and the liquid line, typically, I would be flushing, and, um, you know, for a good flush, I need a good flushing tool, like we kind of referenced already. Let's take a quick look at that again. A good flushing tool. The problem with flushing is I often uh, go into shops and find that this is the type of flush tool that they're using. As you can see here, there's, a, there's like an air chuck on here, so you'd put a quart of solvent in this can, and you charge it with maybe 40, 50 pounds of pressure, and then you hold this rubber blower tip up to the evaporator or the hose or whatever component you're trying to flush. 
I often emphasize that a bad flush is worse than no flush at all. So if you're using a tool like this to flush with a blower tip with a static air char charge uh, fitting, that is, you are better not flushing if this is the kind of tool that we're using. This, the, the air expands, the pressure drops, and you end up with the solvent dropping out inside the evaporator, and now you're left with a dirty soup of, you know, a really dirty soup of uh, solvent and abrasive, uh, abrasive, dirty, abrasive oil. So do not recommend flushing with that type of tool there. Now, the other, uh, the other flushing conundrum that you run into is on thermal expansion valves. So how do I flush a thermal expansion valve system? Typically, like, like we discussed already, you can't flush through a thermal expansion valve. And yet what I've done here, I've taken an old sucked piece of suction line and liquid line hose assembly. I've cut off the rubber piece here. and this, I'm going to attach my flush tool here. And I'm going to run this, the, the liquid line part of it, back into my flush capture container. And so therefore, uh, well, how am I going to, how am I going to, you know, you can't flush through a TXV valve. So how can I do that? Well, here's what I do. If you look here, here is, a, we'll just set this to one side. Here is a, a thermal expansion valve cut in half here so you can see what's going on. You can unscrew. This is threaded. The power valve will unscrew. The uh, superheat plug will, the superheat screw will unscrew here. Take out the superheat spring. Take out the ball bearing. And now you can take it like a half inch drill bit. You'll have to go at a little bit of an angle. And you can drill out the liquid port of the thermal expansion valve. And now you've got yourself a very effective uh, you will have yourself a very effective, uh, you know, an inexpensive flushing tool uh, here. And this will enable you, in fact, if you make up three or four of these, you will find that while thermal expansion valves are very uh, application specific, um, it is possible to, um, uh, it, you know, you'll find that the same block will fit quite a number of different, um, different, different uh, vehicles. So, um, so that's a, 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 you know, a very useful tip, one way, and th that's another reason why when you get the uh, service kit, uh, it's possible to, you know, it comes with the thermal expansion valve, and so you've got, already got everything that you need for a successful repair. So that's how, you know, again, that's how I adapt the old TXV valve to uh, enable flushing. <clears throat> so um, moving right along here, um, so let's look at that on the slide for just a moment, and um, here's here's how you know here's how my hookup looks like when I've actually got it attached to uh, an evaporator through a drilled out thermal expansion valve. So, and this is you know picture paints a thousand words. Here you can easily see follow along with the pictures here how we convert an old thermal expansion valve as an inexpensive and effective uh, evaporator flush adapter. Um, so. Moving right along. So that brings me to the, our conversation about adding oil. As I said, questions about lubrication are probably the most common question we get here at our tech line. And um, you know, proper refrigerant charge level, to, you know, the system needs to be properly charged in order to transport the oil throughout the system. Uh, we want to have the correct type of oil, PEG, mineral, hybrid, electric, and so on, the correct viscosity. Uh, you know, a lot of this you, you can compare to re, re, you know, changing engine oil, and of course, the correct amount. Uh, the oil capacities have halved in the past 20 years. 20 years ago, the average was about eight ounces. Today, it's down around three and a half, four ounces. So you can imagine, you know, being being very precise uh, with the compressor lubrication is pretty important. Uh, this chart here kind of details the different types of, you know, you can take a screenshot of this or a picture. Uh, we will, of course, be posting it later on our, uh, on our Power Hour website. Um, these are some, you know, these are the available oils and the circumstances where you would use them. A question we often get here at our tech line, of course, is, you know, it says to use ND8 or ND9 or ND11. You know, what do these ND numbers translate to? And this chart here um, uh, translate ND numbers to conventional, so an ND8, for example, would be a PAG46. So uh, the oil type and viscosity are set by the compressor manufacturer. So it's very important that you use the correct oil and the correct viscosity uh, for that, you know, for the particular compressor manufacturer that you're using. So here's a classic example. If you go to our website, uh, 4s.com, 
and um, you know, look up this, I think it was for a mid 2000s Chevy truck. And I've added, you know, the two compressors in the middle here are, um, uh, are called for a PAG 150, but we have a replacement compressor. It's a premium replacement compressor. It's a beefed up uh, version because the original equipment compressor was fairly prone to failure. And you see the one on the right here is a much same application, but it's a much more modern design. And that compressor calls for a PAG 46. Uh, the other thing I want to emphasize about oils is it's important to choose a quality oil. Oil, just like your engine oil, there's a lot of deep science goes into the development of refrigerant oils. They're end cap so that they will keep very small amounts of moisture and suspension to prevent the buildup of corrosion and acid in the system. They have ashless anti-wear additives, all kinds of antioxidant additives to prevent you know, chemical deterioration and mischief in the system over time. And um, also, they, they have what we call an ant a quality oil will have an anti-foaming agent. Uh, imagine for a moment, um, you know what happens when you take the cap off a radiator on a hot summer day, uh, how the, you know, the radiator boils over. Well, imagine it's a hot summer day, the vehicle is parked, you know, static pressure in the air conditioning system is probably about 90 PSI, give or take, depending on the temperature. Well, if you start the vehicle up and turn on the air conditioning, the pressure in the crankcase is going to go from 90 PSI to 30, 35 PSI in just a few seconds. While cheap oils will, when you take the pressure off, uh, the oil will foam up, almost explode in a way, inside the uh, crankcase of the compressor, and it interferes with the uh, variable displacement uh, valve in the back of the compressor head. It can wash down the lubricating film on the moving parts inside the compressor. And so I'm just emphasizing, I go into a lot of shops and they're using some kind of a, you know, 100 viscosity universal POE oil. Uh, that is, you know, you're leaving the reliability and the dependability and the, you know, the longevity of the job. Uh, you've now hung out on an inexpensive compromised type of oil. So uh, emphasizing choose a quality oil of the right viscosity, right amount, and so on. So in summary here, um, I'm saying that you know, if when we're about to add oil to a system, I'm assuming, if we've done a good job, uh, that every inch of the refrigerant path is new or flushed. And so therefore, we're starting back with a clean, dry system. So the next thing that's important to understand here is um, uh, you know, oil, you know, our compressors, and every manufacturer has their own procedure, but our, depending on the compressor, our compressor will have, when you take it out of the box, it's going to have a colored label. We may have, um, you know, if we, we may have a pink or a, um, it could be pink in this case here, orange, yellow, green, and so on. So this pink label here indicates that this compressor already has three ounces of the appropriate oil in it. So if it's got three ounces of oil already in the, in the compressor, that means, and let's suppose that it's a seven ounce system, that means I only need to add, I don't need to drain this oil if it's got a pink label, I don't need to drain this oil, it's got three ounces already in it, and I only need to add, an, I would only need to add an additional four ounces to bring the system up to full capacity. So um, the, you know, the question, the big question when it comes to oil is this. Two questions you want to answer when deciding you know, how much oil to use and where to put the oil and so on and so forth. First question is, does the compressor have a crankcase? Right, that's number one. And also, is it an orifice tube type system or a thermal expansion valve system? So uh, we're just gonna, I'm just gonna grab a couple of additional compressors here so we can start the conversation. Um, so here's the compressor we were looking at a moment ago. It's got the pink label. This would indicate it's got three ounces already in it. Uh, so this is an eight series compressor that you would find in a lot of GM vehicles, older GM vehicles. And inside, if we look at it, it looks like this. This com it's an axial design. This compressor, this design compressor, has no crankcase, right? And so if I'm, this one here is an FS10 design. Uh, this would be, you know, gonna find this design here on a lot of Ford vehicles. And the thing to understand, again, axial design, it has no crankcase. So whether I'm adding oil to this compressor or draining oil from it, uh, it's gonna have to be through the suction and discharge ports. Now, if I'm draining a compressor, ordinarily, if you take one of our new compressors out of the box, you shouldn't have to drain it if it's got a pink label. 
Um, but if I'm draining a compressor, I'm going to want to drain it from both the suction and the discharge ports. I'll probably hold it over some kind of a, you know, a waste container and turn the compressor by hand to get all the, as much oil as possible. And I want to take some time to get as much oil as possible out of this compressor. When you're adding oil to the compressor, when we are adding oil to the compressor, uh, we are going to want to add the oil only through the suction port. If it's a, a compressor with no crankcase, I would add it through the suction port. So here I would use, you know, I've got a graduated container, it's going to have the right amount of oil in it, and I would add the oil to the suction port on a compressor with no crankcase. And as I add the oil, I may have to turn it once or twice to draw all the oil into it. So there are axials or design compressors, also old A6s that you would find on 60s, 70s, old GM and different Jaguars and so on and so forth, the big heavy bullet type compressor, A6 they were known as. Those have a crankcase, the old York Tecumseh's also have a crankcase. But what you're more likely to see on a m more modern vehicle is a variable displacement compressor. So here's an, an older GM design, <coughs> v, uh, V5, V7 design type compressor. And this is a variable displacement compressor. And you know that if you look in the rear head here, it's got a control valve that's held in with a snap ring. So this is the displacement control valve. And so this is a variable displacement compressor, and a variable displacement compressor will have a crankcase. And you can see here, this compressor has a drain plug, just like an engine. It's got a crankcase drain plug. So whether I'm adding oil to or draining oil from this compressor, I must do that through the crankcase drain plug. So let's suppose, again, the system called for seven ounces. The compressor came with three ounces of oil already in it. That oil is going to be in the crankcase. So um, my recommendation is to always put about half the oil in the, comp uh, sorry, if it's a fixed displacement compressor like we just looked at with no crankcase, I'm going to put half the total oil charge in the compressor. So in our seven ounce system, I'd add another ounce of oil to my compressor with the pink label and then put the, re the remainder of the oil elsewhere in the system. If it's a variable displacement compressor, on the other hand, um, I'm going to put all the oil in the compressor crankcase. So if this came with a pink label, I, it, I know it's got three ounces already in it, and then I would add another four ounces. So now the total oil charge would be within the compressor crankcase. That's important to understand. Now, the more modern design, what you're more than likely to look, run into on a lot of vehicles today. This is also a variable displacement compressor. Uh, don't forget, we're going to discuss these in detail next month. This one has an electronically controlled variable displacement the, the solenoid. The displacement control valve has been replaced with this solenoid. But again, if I look closely at this compressor, you see it's got a, um, it's got a drain plug. So whether I'm adding oil to or draining oil from this compressor, it's got to go in or out through the drain plug. And I'm going to put the entire total oil charge. Because it's variable displacement, because it has a crankcase, I'm going to put the total oil charge in the crankcase of the compressor itself. So now we want to talk about um, uh, if we just go back to the uh, presentation for just one second. <coughs> so the other question we asked there, whether it was an orifice tube system or a thermal expansion valve system. If it's an orifice tube system with the fixed displacement compressor, in other words, no crankcase, uh, I'm going to put half the oil in the compressor through the suction port, and the other half I'm going to put in, uh, in the accumulator. Now, don't forget, if you're going to put it in the accumulator, and we'll just take a look at that again real quick, if I'm going to put it in the accumulator, Remember, you will need to add it through the port that connects to the uh, evaporator. If you add the oil through the port that connects to the suction line back to the compressor, as soon as this vehicle starts up, it's going to suck that oil back to the compressor and liquid lock it and break something. So you want to add the oil, half the oil charge to the accumulator through the, uh, through the port that connects to the evaporator. On the thermal expansion valve system, with the, with the compressor with no crankcase, I'll put half in the compressor like we discussed, and the other half I will put in the, um, I will put in the evaporator. Um, don't put it in the dryer. If you put it in the dryer, uh, that, the pickup tube in the dryer will pick up that oil immediately on startup, and now you've got a, you know, a foot-long you know, slug of oil arriving at the thermal expansion valve. It will probably straighten up and fly right eventually, but may not for the first 50, you know, 20 minutes or half hour of vehicle operation, by which time you've panicked and think that you know, there's something wrong with the system, when in fact it's the oil working its way through uh, the thermal expansion valve. Uh, just a quick reminder here, uh, one ohm of unwanted resistance in a 
relay or a switch in the compressor circuit and will, will uh, reduce the magnetic, the strength of the magnetic field holding the clutch engaged by almost half. All right, so it'll, one ohm of extra resistance will turn a 48 watt clutch to, into a 27 watt clutch. In other words, the strength of the magnetic field holding the clutch engaged uh, will only be half of what it was um, you know, with, with before the unwanted resistance. And what this really comes against you is you've worked on the vehicle in the shop, you're working it inside in, in, you know, under shade, and then when the next evening when the customer's in stop go traffic, head pressures 275, 300 PSI, maybe in extreme circumstances, now that week that 27 watt clutch can't hold it and the clutch starts to slip. So again, check that this clutch has full system voltage available at the clutch before you turn it back to the customer. So we want to talk about uh, the importance of condenser airflow here. Here we're blocking airflow by sliding a piece of cardboard uh, behind the condenser in front of the radiator. So the data, this is just two data PIDs exported from uh, the scan tool and you can see engine, you know, the, the first point there is where we introduced that piece of cardboard. Uh, then you can see where we removed it and you can see that from we put it in to when we removed it, it's a time of about 20 seconds and AC head pressure literally doubled. Um, and in fact, if you study the graph carefully, you will see that coolant temperature actually uh, dropped by a couple of degrees. Uh, that's because we removed the heat coming off the condenser. We stopped it hitting the radiator, so engine coolant temperature actually dropped. Now the takeaway, the point that I want to really emphasize here is, uh, if you thought you had an airflow problem or a condenser airflow problem, oftentimes people will, will look at engine coolant temperature and think that if, the, if I had an airflow problem, surely the engine would at least be running hot or maybe even overheating. In actual fact, it's often the reverse. Um, a, a slight change in condenser airflow can have a huge impact on air conditioning performance, but be virtually unnoticed on engine coolant temperature. So it's very important that we you know, that we check condenser airflow. Now, a common cause of airflow issues, of course, is um, a failed viscous fan clutch. Oh, three and up Dodge trucks were notorious for this. The compressor would get replaced several times, and we would end up with the liquid line getting clogged with a bunch of debris. This vehicle uses a captured orifice tube, and so, um, you know, the compressor gets replaced over and over. Uh, the orifice tube, the liquid line is clogged, and so around and around we go when the root cause, the root failure on this vehicle is the electroviscous fan clutch. It may set trouble codes, but doesn't turn on the check engine light. Nobody checks the function of the thermal, of the electroviscous fan clutch. Now, if we look at a fan clutch, we'll just very quickly look at a couple of fan clutch. Here's a conventional uh, thermal fan clutch here. Uh, we, we use some, this is a silicone fluid that we use to drive the clutch. It's about 10 different viscosities of this depending on the application. And bottom line, there's a reservoir on the front and the thermal valve here, we can pump the fluid into the work, into and out of the working area. You can probably see it here. It's like a tongue and groove, land and groove effect <laughs> here. So uh, the problem with fan clutches is because it's a viscous coupling, it's not a solid mechanical coupling, it's gradual engagement, 30%, engagement, 40%, 50%, percent, and so on, it can be very difficult to know if the fan is turning at the proper speed. And so um, you may be able to do uh, on a, a modern system with an electroviscous fan clutch, you may and you may not, depending on the scan tool and the application, be able to look at uh, commanded speed versus actual speed and so on and so forth. Point I'm driving home here is that viscous fan clutches, both conventional and electroviscous fan clutches, uh, are a common cause of reduced condenser airflow and repeat compressor failure and customer complaints of poor air conditioning performance. That's the, the, the point I'm trying to make. <clears throat> So, uh, wrap it up here with some refrigerant news. I think we're all very familiar with the fact that, um, you know, this has been around for 10 years. I'm sure you've had, had some experience working on R1234 IF systems. The pressure temperature profile is virtually identical to 134A. For the most part, it's the same old, same old. Um, the real reason for the conversion, of course, is climate change. Uh, R134A has a global warming value of about 1300. Uh, the new product, R1234F, has a global warming value of 
the published value is four. I believe it's actually less than one. And so <laughs> that's the biggest difference. On the vehicle, the big thing you have to understand is the oil, uh, <coughs> because the, of the chemical instability of the new refrigerant, it, uh, it requires a much better oil. So uh, the PAG oil for 1, 2, 3, 4 IF systems has a heavy duty additive package to stabilize the chemistry in the system. Those oils, are, if it's the same uh, viscosity, are backwards compatible with 134A systems, but you can't use 134A oil in a YF system. The other thing, I showed you this earlier, there's the internal heat exchanger. You're going to find that on most, not all, but most R1234 vehicles. The evaporator is supposed to be manufactured to a higher standard. Uh, a new evaporator should have a, a label on there that says MIS J2842. And, um, um, you know, it, 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 but it, fu it functions and works the same. If it weren't for the label, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between a conventional evaporator. And honestly, I see them leak just the same. They're, they're, I've seen quite a few of these replaced due to leaks. However, the big service, that, of course, it takes longer to recover recharge because all the uh, leak checking and identification functions built into the new machines. But the biggest service difference that I think you have to be aware of is Remember, R134A takes 13 years to break down in the atmosphere. R1234F breaks down in 11 days. So there's a dramatic chemical stability difference between 134A and YF. And so if you do a sloppy job, in other words, if you don't pull a deep vacuum, get all the moisture out of the system, one of the problems with YF systems, and especially if you don't use the right oil, you can get very rapid acid buildup in an r 1234 f system. That's why it's important to do a very a deep vacuum, proper flushing, and to use the right oil to, to prevent uh, acid, pretty rapid acid buildup in an R1234 IF system. Don't forget, uh, you know, we, we mentioned we're going to talk about R134A retrofitting. R134A has been phased down. It's already at about 90% uh, of 2013 production, about to go to 60%, I think, in October of this year. And by 2020, 30, 2036, which is not that far away, uh, it will be down at 15% of 2013 production. So the big conversation at the moment is uh, retrofitting of R134A systems. I mean, there's still millions of them on the road. Um, and so if R134 is going away, we need to have refrigerant options for those vehicles already on the road. So there's two. <coughs> The, the big proposals at the moment, the, big, the two big pieces that are getting traction at the moment are there is a proposal, it's been already submitted, uh, some of the chemical companies have made a submission to the EPA under the SNAP program, the Significant New Alternatives program, to use R1234YF as a retrofit refrigerant. And uh, you know, you would require it would require new labeling, of course. You would have to replace the, the would, you would attach uh, non-removable service ports to convert from 134A to R1234F. Of course, you would have to use the new oil. Uh, there could be performance issues. There, there, you know, this hasn't begun yet, or hasn't, you know, there's no, you know, we haven't done any testing. There's no actual vehicles in the field with this, with the retrofitted vehicles in the field yet. But the likelihood is, the expectation is that before the end of the year, R1234F will be approved as a retrofit refrigerant for R1234, sorry, for R1, old R134A systems. Keep in mind that there will be, you know, a, use requirements, labeling, service ports. Maybe we'll need some different thermal expansion valves and internal heat exchangers to improve the performance. The, the, those are bridges that have not yet been crossed. The other option is a product called R450, R456A. It's a combination of three refrigerants, or uh, R1234ZE, R134A, and another product called R32. And uh, that's also been submitted to the EPA. The, the uh, advantage of that product is it can be used as a drop-in refrigerant. So you would use your existing R134A machine to recover and recharge this new product. Uh, you would use the same uh, service ports and so on and so forth, but you would uh, you, you could still use the same service ports, um, same oil, and same recovery, recycling, recharging machine. But you would have to label the system uh, that the, it was using this uh, alternative refrigerant. So um, again, uh, just to wrap it up here, don't forget to go to 4S.com, click on that Technicians Resources tab, and underneath that there is a raft of very detailed technical 
Uh, the one I've highlighted in the lower center there is maximum heat load temperature testing. Some people call it differential temperature testing. In other words, using temperature testing to get diagnostic direction on a system that's not working well, or maybe optimizing charge level and so on. Um, the other thing, of course, as I mentioned, uh, you know, when you're on the Four Seasons page, if you click on the YouTube link, uh, don't, you see where I've got the two big X's up the top there? Don't search there. If you come down the middle of the page toward the right, there's another search box. If you search, that will search within our channel, within the Four Seasons channel. Accuracy there, we've got a raft of quite a number of videos on dye leak checking, flushing, and so on and so forth. This is a great resource for you know finding videos on how to you know how to perform different uh, air conditioning AC uh, service procedures. These are some of the specific links for flushing, dye and electronic leak checking, and the importance of refrigerant charge level. Remember, overcharge it, you slug it, liquid lock, something's going to break, undercharge it, all drops out no lubrication. Charge level, very important. And so class recap here, you know, how original compressors failed. We discussed what to flush, what to replace, uh, the pros and cons of flushing versus replacing, compressor lubrication, adding oil, where to add it, and so on and so forth. Uh, some quick service tips uh, that we shared as we went along, and we wrapped it up there with some R123, or sorry, R134A retrofitting information. So uh, that's almost it for the day. Um, don't forget to join us again next month. The topic will still be air conditioning, where we'll be digging deeper on uh, electronically controlled variable displacement uh, compressors, in other words, computer controlled uh, compressors. And that's about it for today. Let me wrap it up here and check with Corey to see do we have any questions before we say goodbye. So, Peter, yeah, we actually had quite a few come through, but they, they, a lot of them really lined up the same. So I'm going to really break it down to two pretty common questions that came okay. through. Uh, the first one is, okay, if I don't have, if this is if they are looking and they don't have the oil capacity specification somewhere listed, is there a way to know how much oil to add to the system? That's the first question. Okay, so if you don't have an oil capacity spec, uh, kind of a rough rule of thumb is if you have a refrigerant capacity, let's suppose, you know, go with the 20 to 25 percent of refrigerant capacity. So, for example, if I had a system that called for 25 ounces of R134A, then about five ounces of oil should get you in the ballpark with the, with a system like that. All right. Well, and then going along with that same kind of question, this came up several times of, Okay, how about if I don't have a refrigerant charge capacity specification somewhere listed that I can just easily access, is there a way to know how much refrigerant a system calls for? That is a tougher question. Um, so on an orifice tube system, it is relatively easy to fine tune the charge level in the system by monitoring the temperature difference across the evaporator. You just keep shrinking, you know, gradually over a period of time, keep shrinking the temperature difference across the evaporator until it's zero, until there's no temperature difference. Uh, thermal expansion valve systems, a little bit more complicated. And for that, I, going back to what I mentioned previously, if you go to our website, 4S.com, technicians, resources, and download that uh, differential temperature testing uh, document, or we may have called it maximum heat load temperature testing, that goes into great detail on opt using temperature testing to optimize the charge level on both orifice tube type systems and thermal expansion valve systems when you don't know, um, you know, what the original charge level, you know, what the proper charge level is. I, I should point out that this often comes up if you've taken out a tube, an older vehicle, you've taken out a tube and fin condenser, and the replacement condenser is a flat tube multipass, maybe a very efficient condenser, may even be a better condenser, but often or adjust the, refer the system charge level uh, to get that uh, condenser to work properly in the system. And again, uh, that document on our website will be very helpful with that. That's all I have for now. I'll let you take us out. Thank you, Corey. Uh, and don't forget to join us next month, Electronic Control Variable Displacement Compressors. Uh, thank you, and uh, we will see you again soon. Thank you.